Thank you everyone for, for joining us. Uh, Bruce Stevenson gave a presentation entitled John Nolan, Olmsted Disciple at Bock Tower Gardens earlier this year. And, and it was so well received that we wanted to make sure more people had an opportunity opportunity to, to hear it. So we've asked Bruce to re-record his lecture as part of Lake Wales Envisioned, a citywide visioning effort for the city of Lake Wales. You can learn more about it at lakewalesenvision.com. Bruce is a professor at Rollins College and an expert in all things John Noland and his association and partnership with the Olmsted Brothers. I'll turn it over to you now, Bruce. Thank you, Eric. John Nolan and Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. were founders of the modern city planning profession. What's interesting, they both picked up the torch Frederick Law Olmsted Sr., the great landscape architect, passed on. And the book I wrote, John Nolan, Landscape Architect and City Planner, looks at the evolution of landscape architecture and city planning. The important lesson for us today is that Nolan and Olmsted Jr. both created seminal projects in Florida. They worked at the same time, oftentimes together. And just to give you an example how similar their design process was, is that my opening photo is Box Sanctuary on the top, and below is John Nolan's plan for Savannah, Georgia, Daffin Park. John Nolan is best known as the patron saint of the new urbanism. In fact, his plan for Venice, Florida, as you can see, inspired the plan for Seaside, Florida, which is elemental to the project that is currently going on Lake Wales. In fact, John Nolan's uh, vision for Florida has been roundly copied by new urbanists to a wonderful degree. As we see on the left is John Nolan's business card. On the right is a guidebook to new urbanism in Florida, which utilizes uh, the projects that Nolan put forth 100 years ago. I'm also uh, proud to be a winner of the John Nolan Medal, which includes uh, wonderful architects. I'm an academic, not an architect, so it's wonderful for me to study the work that Andres Stwani, Elizabeth Platter Zybrook, and Victor Dover have done. In fact, I'm studying Lake Wales because I believe is a crucial, crucial project that will tell us much about the future of Florida. In fact, here is Olmsted Jr. and John Nolan working together on projects in Florida in the 1920s. So again, when we look at the future of Florida, we want to go back to these great masters that inspired a vision from the past that is still relevant. In fact, 100 years ago, John Nolan's plan for St. Petersburg came forth, and he called Florida the great laboratory of town and city planning. 100 years later, I believe Lake Wales has the same opportunity St. Petersburg did 100 years ago, and that's what we want to investigate today. And there's an important study that I think references all this. It was done in 2005 by the University of Pennsylvania, and on the left is a, what, a vision of what Orlando would look like in the year 2050. You see the light pink, that's existing development. The darker pink, if, if we continue to sprawl out. On the right is a transit-oriented development plan. What that means in real English is, if you look at that eye, that looks like a bloodshot eye. It looks like my students on a Friday morning. That's a rail system. And if we put a rail system in and all those red dots where people could live where the car would be an option, and you see in return by condensing development, all that green space, a great, a great green belt of natural lands is created that not only is good for the wildlife, but it protects the water supply. But what I want to show that's is especially important is the Lake Wales Ridge becomes uh a key element in this natural system. And this is what we want to look at today is how Lake Wales is in position to define the future. I wanted to go uh, and look briefly at John Nolan because Nolan is a special character in our understanding of town planning. Nolan um, had a, a rough life. His father was shot when he was a year and a half old in a political argument. And this ended up uh, uh, dire circumstances in his life, but fortunately he was able to go to an orphanage called Girard College, which was founded 
by Stephen Girard, who was the wealthiest man in the United States in the 1830s and part of the early reform movement. So Nolan grew, grew up, but he had this advantage of growing up in a place where he could look out each day, imagine looking out and seeing the neoclassical design. And it was also part of the education he received of the Renaissance and this belief that America was part of a Renaissance, a rebirth of classical thought and ideals, both in thinking and in physical form. What's important to remember was the American Renaissance was a defining point in the United States, where the United States became the wealthiest country in the world. And the question was, what do we do with our wealth? And the model was the Italian Renaissance and especially the Medici. The Medici invented accounting. They developed a great capitalistic system and wealth, but they also invested in the arts. And this is a famous painting that tells us much about the Renaissance. There's no religious figures. And you see the young man there, that's actually Michelangelo. And he looks flustered because Lorenzo El Magnifico, who's in the center point, is asking him, are you sure you know what you're doing? And everybody else is laughing because Michelangelo is the only one in the room who doesn't know he's a genius. But this patronship of the arts and capitalism defines Nolan's career. And Andrew Carnegie is the Medici of that period where they're investing in the future of the nation, investing in arts, investing in education. And part of what is essential to Nolan is when he goes to the Wharton School, he comes out of an orphanage. He's the first person from Girard College to ever get to the University of Philadelphia. He goes to the Wharton Business School and they study German reform because it's essential to remember the Germans were the first one investing in what we call the modern welfare state. And the simple equation in Germany was if we we're going to become a modern industrial power, we need to invest in the laboring classes. And you can see this image of everything designed perfectly. And you wonder why Germany wins the soccer, uh, the soccer, the world soccer event. Well, there's a soccer field set right in the middle of these planned neighborhoods. So this is what Nolan studied in the Wharton School. He also, in his summers, spent his time in the Catskills working for Candace Wheeler. She owned a resort and Olmsted was in charge with gardening and entertainment. And you could see the figures that he was working with Candace Wheeler. And of course, there's Mark Twain. So Nolan has this amazing opportunity to work with the rich and the famous. He spends his spare time hiking in the Catskills, looking at the paintings uh, of the great Hudson River Valley School. And he comes to this great conclusion that happiness is learned by the ability to transform your life from within. And by the time he graduates from the Wharton School, he has this great connection between economics and art. Candace Wheeler would work with Lewis Comfort Tiffany in designing the White House. And later they would work together at the World's Fair, where on the left, Candace Wheeler designed the women's uh, exhibit, and Lewis Comfort Tiffany designed the chapel, which is currently in Winter Park, Florida. My point in this that the Chicago World's Fair was this defining moment in American history and American city planning, where over 12 million Americans visited the Chicago World's Fair and saw this site, this amazing construction of a city to see the wonders of the world. And what separated the American Chicago World's Fair from the Paris World's Fair uh, six years earlier that had the Eiffel Tower was here's this amazing town of Olmsted's park right in the center of it. So that becomes the vision of the American city. How do we meld nature and urbanism together in a meaningful way? And Nolan will go on after graduating from the University of Pennsylvania and work in adult education for a decade, but he'll study the Italian Renaissance. And he'll also work with professors in the field. And he'll come to this understanding of what's called the new humanism. And it was the belief that Orthodox religion after Darwin had fallen away, and that the United States, if it was going to succeed in the future, would have to adopt the classical virtues of Greece and Rome. And their single biggest challenge was the city and how to create a livable environment that celebrated the arts as well as consumerism. And as again, 15th century Italy is the model. And Nolan in his first speech will even go on to say, 
that the future is what Aristotle called the good life is can our consciousness, can our ability to see the public good match our private interest? And there's this famous painting by Thomas Cole, which shows on the left, God and nature, and right, the future of the great city. Now, these two forces would have to merge together in the future. Nolan takes a year's sabbatical. He goes to the University of Munich, where he studies German town planning and Renaissance art. And I think we would all agree those are probably the two most important skills to be a good town planner. And again, that's the skill set that's being applied in Lake Wales. An example is this famous painting on top of the ideal city that was actually built in Pienza, Italy. And it becomes this model that John Nolan studies and learns the art of town planning. As you can see, there's this little crevice between these two buildings, this little link, and here's what it looks like today. Again, the merging of urbanism and the natural environment. Nolan would return to the United States where a book would await him called Charles Eliot, Landscape Architect. Charles Eliot was the son of President uh, Eliot of Harvard, and tragically, he died at a young age of 37, but he had worked closely with Frederick Law Olmsted Sr. in putting together a number of model projects, including this plan for the future of Boston and its water supply, which included preserving the water supply and running a series of interconnected green corridors from the water supply in the mountains down into the coastal areas of Boston. Nolan returns, he reads this book, considers it sacred, and decides to become a landscape architect. And lo and behold, when he arrives, he's pretty much adopted by the president of Harvard, Charles Eliot, to replace his lost son. And Nolan will go on to become a lead landscape architect. And I just put these two photos in before Nolan went to uh, Harvard to study landscape architecture. He did this exploration of Central Park. And it was just amazing what a work of art it was and how it lined with his own artistic sensibilities. And what he saw was not just the beauty of Central Park, but on the right, people being happy in the park, which is uh, illustrated in this painting by Corot. So Nolan studied landscape architecture. And before he emerges into the practical application of landscape architecture, he'll study landscape painting and become aware with the vision of the painters and how Olmsted Sr. would apply painting or a picturesque scene in creating his parks. And the one lesson I think we have to take away tonight that you'll be quizzed on, but it's essential to what is being done in Lake Wales today, is when you studied landscape architecture, you studied da Vinci's principles of art. And when you look at the painting of Mona Lisa, it's important to remember that it's not her smile, but it's the background. It's nature in motion. That was the important item that was set forth with the belief if we understood how nature moved, we could understand how the world worked and become closer to God. A radical idea at the time, but da Vinci's lesson was follow nature, then your imagination. And again, these are the principles that are being applied today. And the idea of the Renaissance was in contrast to medieval times when you saw Notre Dame and you looked up, you're immediately looking up to heaven and praying that you weren't going to hell. Well, the Renaissance brought a whole new view of the world. Their idea was to extend the human vision. And the first gardens built in a thousand years did exactly this, where this is the Medici, uh, one of the Medici villas overlooking Florence. And the whole idea was to have an extension of the human vision and if you left your villa, you walked down here, and here's the view you had out to the horizon. And in the background, you could even see the Duomo. So there's this new orientation of seeing the world. And of course, Olmsted uh, would teach his students. I should mention, Olmsted was Nolan's professor when he did his first practical application. And there is Nolan's first park project where this vista, he does the same thing, puts a mall. Uh, a same vista, and that's the photo I began the lecture with. So Nolan is taking these ideas of the Italian Renaissance and also what he's learning, especially, especially important from Olmsted Sr.'s parks. And Olmsted Jr. would take Nolan and his class to New York City. And this was Olmsted, uh, Nolan's uh, 
acclaim when he first went to Prospect Park in Brooklyn, one of the most famous designs where you go through the stark arch and tunnel and emerge into this wonderful meadow called the Long Meadow. And on the left is NOLA, and the right is what it looks like today, when the model projects in the United States. Nolan would go on to write the first biography of Frederick Olmsted Sr. I can't make this point or emphasize this enough. Olmsted Jr. was Nolan's professor. He said, hey, you want to get honors? Write a biography of my father. So Nolan did this really interesting analysis of five Olmsted projects. And I love this. This is what the parks looked like in the early 1900s, almost like paintings. But as you could see, Nolan's chief concern was to take Olmsted's plan and finish him. And again, that's what Dover Cole is working on today, to take an Olmsted plan and bring it to fruition. The other thing that separates Olmsted Sr. from his son and John Nolan is the creation of the park plan. Olmsted Sr. dies in 1903, well known for Central Park, but his son puts together these park systems where parks would be connected by parkways, these green corridors, and this plan was done for Portland in 1904. This is what my students always read, one of the first park plan in the United States. And of course, this is what it looks like today. And Olmsted and Nolan will go on to author this article that defines how to create modern public park systems. So when we look at a park system, that concept begins with Olmsted Jr. and John Nolan. Nolan's first project is in Charlotte, North Carolina. And on the way, of course, you can't help but see Olmsted's great works in North Carolina. And of course, this is Biltmore, and he bends his knee to the genius of Olmsted, but especially likes going off trail and where he finds the way the parks and the landscape uh, is put together is much like the symphony of nature. He also comes face to face with racism. And this is a message that is new, I think, in our understanding of John Nolan and the Olmsted brothers is their response to racism. Nolan was from Philadelphia, Boston, had never been South before, and he was pretty dumbfounded by the racism, especially the poverty of the African-American neighborhood. And you can see on the right, and he talks about how we have to make these improvements in economic, sanitary, aesthetic, humanitarian for the African-American neighborhood. And currently I'm working on a new book John Nolan, Klansman in the City Plan, Thomas Dixon, John Nolan, The Birth of a New Nation. Because what happens when Nolan comes to Charlotte is he hasn't been exposed to the South. His second night in town, he's taken out to a play called The Klansman, which is based on a novel, The Klansman, and would become the model for Birth of a Nation, the first blockbuster film in America and arguably the most racist. And after the play finishes, the audience erupts in applause. Nolan is dumbfounded. He cannot believe that this overtly racist spectacle has brought applause. And of course, Nolan will go on to champion equity and design African-American neighborhoods in the same manner he'll design neighborhoods for the white working class. Also, Nolan works in the academic realm. He edits this book, The Art of Landscape, Gardening by Humphrey Repton. And Repton has a skill set of doing before and after, which Dover Cole has done in these paintings. So the same skill set that Nolan's applying of showing before and after is a skill set that's alive and well in Lake Wales today. And finally, I want to get into one of Nolan's first projects. It's based on Olmsted's plan for Riverside, Illinois. It is called Myers Park, a green suburb. And as you can see, Here's the plan. Notice each of these dots are trees along something called parkways. And there's an open area with a stream in the middle. Here's what it looks like today. Here's this beautiful area. Uh, it's what we call good stormwater management. If it ever floods, uh, the homes are protected. And then look at the tree canopy of uh, Charlotte 100 years later. So Nolan's works are still with us, wonderful models. And he would apply his work uh, in the South to begin with, and he would take this park system plan and he applied it for in one of his first plans in Roanoke. You can see the same interconnected system of green, how essential that is. 
And here's what it looks like today. And just let me back up. There's Mill Mountain, one of the preserves. And this is Roanoke River, another one. And both of these are protected. And here's what they look like today. Nolan also had to work with the issue of urbanism. Roanoke had, as you can see, prepare to meet thy God, one of the worst downtowns in America. And what Nolan's skill set was always to take advantage of local uh, innovation. So he took the plan for the University of Virginia, superimposed it on downtown Roanoke, and that became the plan for Roanoke to move ahead. So Nolan had the skill set. He had amazingly um, coordinated plans, but the issue was city planning wasn't really taken seriously. But it does move forward in the development of what we call the English Garden City. It's a great novel, second most read novel of the 19th century by Edward Bellamy called Looking Backward was written on the left or the dark, uh, dark, dingy cities of the 19th century. In the uh, right is the future that this book portends where the lead character falls asleep, wakes up 50 years later to cities that are beautiful and well-designed. And this book sparks the a movement in England to create garden cities. And Ebenezer Howard, uh, who actually brings Edward Pellamy to England, puts together this model of the garden city, which is actually built in 1902 and 1903 in a place called Letchworth, England. And John Nolan is in this group, along with Olmsted Jr., of people coming to England to study these innovations. And the important lesson for us today, whether it's Lake Wales, Winter Park, or Letchworth, England, is the middle way that Howard wanted density at the right density. And that density or is the density that makes the car an option, about 12 units per acre. But if you're going to put people closer together in this middle way, you have to have amazing, amazing high quality public spaces like you see on the right. And Nolan will experiment with these plans, uh, working for capitalists in the United States in between 1914 and 1917, because World War I had created a demand for American uh, goods and weapons. And the issue was there wasn't enough quality housing for workers who were protesting on the left. So the capitalists would build quality housing. And Nolan would design it for their labor force would be more stable. And it's always fascinating. Nolan, I remember he was an orphan, is always showing how children uh, prosper in these places. But what really makes city planning uh, an issue and makes it um, an investment by the United States government is World War I. During World War I, was recognized that if we were going to defeat the Germans, we had to produce more weapons and better weapons. And the idea become, begins in England and comes to the United States that we have to do quality worker housing. And here's Nolan in England mixing with his, with his cohorts over there on how to develop this. And what happens during World War I is the United States invests in worker housing. Nolan and Olmsted Jr. design more of these projects than any other uh, planners employed by the government. And this is uh, Union Park Gardens which is based on this elemental scheme of we follow the natural environment. There's a creek uh, and a, a Greenway Park going down the middle of this development. Here's what it looks like today. The Greenway is in the back and this housing, which is all again at this right density between four and eight units is beloved. And you can see the care that, that it has. And also it has these elemental concepts of scale, quality, good building materials, and what we call a sense of place. Nolan, after World War I, thought that the peace dividend would go towards building these same type of uh, federally subsidized housing. In fact, he even wrote a book at the, instance, uh, at the insistence of the United States government, and it's all detailed in that. But politics came in, that idea collapsed, no one was somewhat bereft, but he had this amazing opportunity by the richest woman in the United States, Marie Emery, to design a neighborhood based on English Garden City of Letchworth in Ohio. And so I want to briefly go through this project because Mar uh, Marymount, Ohio, 
It was called the national exemplar to be a national model. And to this day, I think it is. If we want to understand the future of Lake Wales, I think we can understand the, vi the vision and the concrete um, perception and sense of place that defines Marymount. On the left is Letchworth, England. On the right is Marymount. As you can see, the close similarity. But the key point is how Nolan designed this. If you look, the town center isn't actually in the town center. It's on the highest point. And all the green spaces you see here were flood prone areas that he preserved. And then he created this mini green belt around the town to enhance the views of the water, something the Olmsted brothers would do in Lake Wales. This area right here that's preserved, there's what it looks like is a steep ravine. You can see how steep it was. I always thought it'd be a great place to do the sequel to The Last of the Mohicans, where you have this bit of wild nature, in this pretty little urban town. And then as you work your way up that creek, there's a lagoon, and then the first of a series of parks. But what is especially important is the park, as you see on the right, plays into a small town center. And let me show you how that works. There we go. There's the church. The only item on the entire property of Marymount was completely land developed was a cemetery. So Nolan cited a church there. And that church, if you look at the corner of this church, that corner aligns with the corner of this building. And this is what we call mixed use. There's people living up here. There's an office down here. And here's the view this landscape architect has from here, looking across this small green to the church. And there's that view. And I could leave with this slide here. This is the epitome of what we call the art of civic design uh, in Marymount, Ohio, which Nolan completed in the early 1920s. In fact, there's the church. I had the opportunity to speak inside the church. If you can see in the background, this is a slide of Marymount, and this is a slide of Baldwin Park, which are modeled on those two points. There they are. I moved in there so I could live in a place similar to Marymount. This is what we call new urbanism. But again, it's a hint of that proper amount of density we need so we can create great places and preserve nature like you see here. So the give and take in Marymount is we're going to put people a little closer together. In return, we get an amazing public space. And this is looking from the church to the school in this amazing landscape. There's the church. There's the school. And we work our way through the town. This neighborhood is a beautiful example of garden apartments at the density of about 12 units per acre. Uh, Ohio Department of Transportation really screwed this up. But look how artistic this is. Here's where the pedestrians go. Here's where the cars go. And the scenery or the model you can see is straight out of Germany with the kids. And when you go back into the neighborhood, it's designed so it literally looks like a work of art. And again, this is affordable housing. We're going to go from that neighborhood to the town center. And this is crucial to understand the play of the different elements that also exist in Lake Wales, town center, town hall, village green, parkway, and amazingly beautiful scenery. Let me run through that. There's the town center. There's the fountain. And again, Mary Mont's in the National Historic Register for good reason. There's what it looks at like at night. This is taken by my students, literally a piece of art. And there's one of the parkways in Marymount. And I want to make sure we understand a parkway, park and a way on either side. That's the John Young Parkway in Orlando. That does not count as a parkway. The state of Florida should be sued for that because here's what happens when you misname a parkway. There's the type of accidents that make Orlando the least safe place to drive in the United States. This is the village green in Marymount. And it's kept entirely natural and with a statue to its uh, statuary to its founding family. Again, this mix of nature and the city and something Lake Wales needs to think about. And I want to make sure we look at this connection between the town hall, Nolan and all his plans will put town hall, the city government at this really important location, then put this beautiful parkway and walkway to the most beautiful view of nature with the idea that our government and our Republican duty, small r, is in a setting uh, that takes place where nature and our Republican duties are in harmony. And again, taking this concept from the Italian Renaissance, we're going to go straight from the town hall down to this place called the Concourse. 
And that's what we see along the way. People on the parkway, they want to be there. It's a great place to get out. There's the terminus. And this is all kept natural. So as we approach this, uh, these cliffs overlooking the Miami River, uh, you'll see this amazing view. So there's the concourse. You can see that there's what it looks like. And these are actually little windows with uh, amazing views. Again, it's a place you've literally just seen this you want to be in. And there's what it looks like, uh, the view. And I got a little carried away with the Thomas Cole view. But there's, again, one of my students took, that's the view everybody gets for free. So that value radiates throughout Marymount. And again, Marymount is this connection of parks that center on better families. And this was a statue devoted to the family of three generations could all live in Marymount. And of course, I think that's the same that we want in Lake Wales. Nolan also put dollars and cents to work where we could actually determine the value of the real estate by its location to certain amenities. And this was all calculated in his book, New Ideals. And of course, what happens to both Nolan and Olmsted, although Nolan is ahead on this, is the great Florida land boom, this cornucopia of wealth being dumped on the, you know, on the state of Florida, the greatest real estate boom in the history of the world. Uh, and then of course, it occurs with this new post-World War I consumer culture where we have things called vacation and tourists and tourist seasons begin and Florida becomes a destination. And there's Uncle Sam flirting with Miss Florida. Uh, my view on this is, Miss Florida should have got a prenup. But what we see when Nolan comes to Florida is he calls it a great laboratory of town and city planning, where he plans St. Petersburg to be the jewel of an American Riviera, styled after the French Riviera. And this photo is actually from John Nolan's presentation in St. Petersburg, where he says we are styling uh, St. Petersburg on Nice, France. The other thing Nolan did was apply this park system. And this is really important because he puts it around what wasn't the real the real boundaries of St. Petersburg at the time. In 1923, about 10,000 people lived in this area, but he was expecting a grand future city. But what, what this is, and it's uh, noted up here, these were wetlands and lands that would flood, or also he also sought to preserve the barrier islands uh, where you would die in a hurricane. It was interesting to know that at that time, there were no connections between St. Petersburg and the beach because hurricanes had uh, destroyed all the bridges. Today, unfortunately, Nolan's plan wasn't followed and this dark red area is evacuation areas. In other words, if you don't leave these in a, during a hurricane, you will die. You see how closely aligned they are. And this is if a category five hurricane was to hit um, Tampa Bay, Again, it's Nolan's genius. He wanted to preserve these areas and develop this areas, the area that also escaped a hurricane. And when you look a little closer, here is uh, that barrier island. And Nolan put the idea that you could run a tram into uh, the mainland. And here again, this would be modeled on Nice, France, where the yellow is hotels, the purple is mixed use. And this is a streetcar system. The purple is mixed use, and it represents a five-minute stop on the streetcar. And it, this vision is what we now call Nice, France. This is what Nice, France looks like today. And of course, this is what Nolan's vision was. And it's not entirely crazy. In fact, uh, St. Petersburg had built the first or created the first public waterfront in the state of Florida, modeled on Nice, France. And it was uh, it was in existence when Nolan came, so he's merely extending the vision of Nice, France, and there's that beautiful plan that extends throughout St. Petersburg. Again, purple is what we call mixed use, yellow is tourist uses, and all these different greens are different types of parks. So you'd always be within a uh, five minute walk of a park. And these areas are what we call today's stormwater management, but these are uh, creeks that would follow their floodplains and preserve those areas. Unfortunately, Nolan's plan did not work because when you look at this plan, you can't tell where the black and white neighborhoods were. And there was a distinct desire on the people of St. Petersburg when they voted on this plan not to improve African-American neighborhoods. And so the idea of the plan, of planning itself was ignored, it fell away. And Nolan uh, was very discouraged, but he moved on to Venice, Florida, 
where he worked for a private developer and drew drew this grand plan for almost 100,000 acres um, along the Mayaka River and into Venice. And today, the Mayaka River, which he saw as preserving, uh, that actually has happened. And Nolan also uh, addressed by designing an African-American neighborhood on the same principles that he would design a, a white working class neighborhood with a protected area along the Mayaka River, a series of small town centers, and many of the design features that you saw in Marymount. And here, there's a town on a larger scale. Uh, Nolan is most best known for designing the city of Venice, again, with the public waterfront protected and the architecture and design of the Mediterranean style uh, that he put forth to create a certain culture. And there's what it looks like today, this beautiful mix of art and physical design. In fact, there's a, when the apartment complexes was built before the Great Depression, there's what it looks like today, this beautiful sense of scale. And he applied this also to larger homes and smaller homes. But the lesson in Venice, again, is by putting people closer together in these apartment districts, they were able to preserve the beachfront, this amazing setting that also is resilient in the face of storms. And again, here's this beautiful walk. This is where it says view. It's the first place you can view the Gulf of Mexico. That's where Nolan puts the town hall and other civic buildings. And again, here's this walk. And at the terminus, this is what you get for free. And so Nolan has this great concept. The Great Depression hits. Florida is hit first. And eventually, as you can see, Florida cities abandon. Nolan's practice um, evaporates. And he is forced to uh, quit his Florida work because the commission simply aren't there. He takes up teaching at Harvard, where he takes over where Olmsted Jr. left off and teaches the town planning programs. And Nolan was a bit of a, a free spirit. If you look at all his teachings, I think the last one is a bit interesting. An outdoor lifestyle, less clothes, less apparatus for player, less spectators, and uh, less active re recreation. He was a practicing nudist along with Raymond Unwin, who designed Letchworth. And of course, their goal was how can we design a garden where you could have a sunbath on your back porch and your neighbors could not see you. But this whole idea of being close to nature, uh, Nolan would continue on, but he's forced to leave Harvard in 1936, where the landscape architecture and city planning program is replaced by modernist architects. Look at this delightful uh, gentleman, Walter Gropius, the modernist architects take over. Nolan spends his time working with Aldo Leopold, who is the uh, first uh, wildlife ecologist in the United States. And he goes to the University of Wisconsin and designs a arboretum. Uh, and today it's the longest going ecological restoration project in the United States. It began in 1936. And I love this photo because there's all the Leopold with his students and they're actually setting fire to this degraded land to bring it back to life. And the Dean got all sorts of calls that you've got some crazy professor who's lost his mind. But uh, Nolan would um, end up, or would die shortly thereafter in the University of Wisconsin Arboretum is also part of his legacy of uh, a pioneer in the art of city planning in America. And Nolan was a Renaissance man. And these are all the skill sets that he had that are also at play in Lake Wales today. And when we look at Nolan to now, there's a great uh, message. I recently had the opportunity to go to the Nolan in San Diego, which is a high-end restaurant and bar overlooking San Diego. But this is also part of Nolan's legacy in uh, San Diego. It's called Torrey Pines, overlooking the Pacific Ocean. And this gives, again, the example of the Olmsted Nolan vision of the best places of nature to be preserved and enjoyed. And this is the work I do in uh, Winter Park, Florida, where we're doing a restoration project called the Genius Preserve on 50 acres of land in downtown Winter Park. And we followed, there's those prairies that Leopold burned. We followed his model and creating our project. 
And it's almost hard to tell which is Winter Park and which is Box Sanctuary, but we've modeled these projects together. So our goal in Winter Park is to become more like Lake Wales. In fact, on the project I work at, there's similar homes, Bach, uh, there's pine wood on the right, the Windsong home in Winter Park. And our project required analysis, but when it came to the design, we adopted the plan for pine wood as our model for the projects we're doing on our preserve. And the work over time is a lot of sweat equity, but we followed the planting plan for Box Sanctuary. In fact, on the left is Box Sanctuary and the right is the Genius Preserve. So we're actually on the same uh, path to harmony, even our beauty berries, which I tell my students are mildly hallucinogenic, but only to get their attention. I know I have your attention, so we can end with the creation of all that labor. That's our project. And we give homage to Box Sanctuary to put this vision together. And it, we were awarded the Thousand Friends Better Community Award for this work. And the work, I think it's important to remember that's going on in Lake Wales is also sanctioned by Thousand Friends of Florida. And Victor gave a wonderful presentation of what you are doing in Lake Wales. And the work in Lake Wales connected, this downtown revitalization plan, takes that same idea of connection that John Nolan had in all his plans, that Frederick Olmsted Jr. had in their plans, and bringing it back to life. And this before and after gives us wonderful examples. And this is Winter Park, Florida, where I live. This is before Victor Dover on the left. This is on the right is after Dover Coal helped redesign downtown Winter Park. And the also designed the gates that go into Winter Park and announces your entrance into a special place designed to the human scale, just like John Nolan's work. And uh, Dover Coal, I think, has a wonderful reputation for putting these projects together. This is a project we worked on 25 years ago, and I got to stick a photo of Nolan in there. I've recently um, wrote an essay on Lake Wales in this book, The Wilder Heart of Florida, Na The Natural Aesthetic of a Naked God. That doesn't go to John Nolan's nudism. It's actually a reference to John Muir. In my last book, Portland's Good Life, Portland was the model for Orlando's sustainability plan. And also Portland provides a living model of this vision of Orlando, where Portland has preserved its outlying agriculture areas and put in this model of urbanism. And when you look at the opportunities of design, defining the future of Florida, here it is, right along this ridge. And this is the challenge that Lake Wales has embraced of how do we do what Nolan envisioned 100 years ago? How do we take the natural, the rural, and the urban landscape together and synergize them to create a great community? That's the opportunity that Lake Wales has. And the next steps will be difficult, It'll be challenging, but you have a wonderful set of principles to follow. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Bruce, for that encore presentation. <laughs> um, we we do have a few uh, questions and, and prompts for um, further conversation. Um, we can get started with those. That the first question um, is is what advice would Nolan and, and Olmsted um, have? today for for how Lake Wales and you know Olmsted's Garden City uh, in Lake Wales and how how should it evolve over the next 10 20 50 years and like can you talk a little bit about how like um why these historic examples and these these concepts are are relevant to uh to now and and to the future um and not not just the past perfect you know what what Noel would tell you is that's exactly what I did. Every time he did a project, he'd have a series of historical examples and exemplars. Like we did Madison, Wisconsin, Interlock in Switzerland. Uh, no, uh, Geneva, Switzerland was his model. And he had a series of um, slides from that. The same thing when he did St. Petersburg, he had Nice, France. And if you see the uh, the slide that's on the uh, up there now, that's simply taking Nice, France and extending it to St. Petersburg. So history... Um, does not lie. It gives us these principles. And again, they're principles. How you apply them now uh, is the big test. But we all 
like human scale. We all like coherent architecture. We all like nature. And I, I serve on the uh, Pearl District Portland Neighborhood Planning Committee. And every time a developer comes in, we ask them, how is this going to affect the pedestrian realm? And developers come to the Pearl District knowing they have to answer that question. And I think what, you know, the end product is, if you are going to be truly connected, when a developer comes to Lake Wales, he or she should expect that question. What are you going to do to make the pedestrian realm good? And how are you going to do, what, how are you going to be able to adapt that? Now, that might not, not happen for another 10 years from now. But I think that concept has to be on the table so that when development goes in, it's, it represents that, it uh, reflects that. And I'm sitting here in beautiful Winter Park and Rollins College where we charge students $42,000 just to take classes. And the reason why we can do that is because we have a beautiful campus. If our campus looked like UCF, that would not happen, right? So there's a value to doing this. And if you walk on Rollins campus, you immediately feel good. I think that's what you want in Lake Wales. You want people to walk into Lake Wales and feel good. Now, that can be done, and you get and the models are there and the principles are there, but it's going to, I think, take an educational process as well as just here are the principles. But the good news is, as human species, we all like that. We all like the feeling those places uh, offer. Yeah, there's a certain timeless component to the, the principles there that have you know, weathered the ups and downs of, of the past. And, and, you know, so we can um, see that they can weather the ups and downs of, of the future as well. Um, I, I was just going to add, I'm mm -hmm. teaching this in my classes right now. I think this applies. Olmsted was a genius. He wasn't a psychologist, but he called it unconscious recreation, that he designed his parks because he saw the cities as places of commercialism, which was great. But you needed to, he said, unbend your mind. And so he actually designed his park. So after walking through them for 20 to 30 minutes, you would unbend your mind and unconsciously, it wasn't even recreation, you call it recreate. Your mind would recreate by exam, by just walking through this beautiful scenery that he designed. And again, I think that's what Lake Wales has, because if you walk through Box Sanctuary for 15 minutes, mm -hmm. you're not the same person. So that kind of ties into another question. What makes uh, Lake Wales and the Lake Wales Ridge in particular um, unique um, in, in John Nolan and Olmst and the Olmsted brothers, their their eyes? Like, is there anything special about the landscape that the city of Lake Wales is on? And is there advice for, for how to use that landscape um, to the the city's you know uh, betterment into the future. Well, I, I, ironically, this is pl a, a plug for myself, I guess. But I had the opportunity to write on uh, with fifteen other authors about your favorite wildest spot in Florida. And for me, the Lake Wales Ridge, going up in those sandy ridges, it has to be a cool day. I can go out hiking on that ridge, is not go on a trail, get lost, and that's half the you know fun finding my way back. But I always can visually know where I am, and also the landscape itself is so unique. So one, I would have two, two key points for the future of Lake Wales. Uh, one is the uniqueness of the landscape, and I would use native landscaping, you know, law of thirds, a third of all landscaping, because you don't have to water it, you don't have to put fertilizer, and bring that landscape mm -hmm. right from Lake Royals Ridge, right in through the town. That would be one. Two would be Box Sanctuary. The design of that um, landscape, of course, there they're using irrigation, but again, a lot most of it's native, and it creates this amazing aesthetic. So you want to have the native landscape of Box Sanctuary, but the scenery, this crafted scenery. When the Olmsteads uh, designed. Box Sanctuary, that designed it almost like you're going through a play or a movie where you go from one scene to the next. And as along the way, you get increasingly sense of beauty till you reach a prime space. And I would do the same thing in the design of Lake Wales, where there's a series of scenes that bring you, and I'm imagining the prime place will be downtown 
um, Lake Wales. So really th through the design of the neighborhoods and the design of the parks or the connection of the parks, you create, if I'm making sense, a set of scenery that's mm -hmm. highlighted by the town center. And you saw that in Nolan's plan for Marymount, right? Where mm -hmm. the town yeah. center was literally the highlight. The genius of place comes into, yeah. into play there. And it's, it's just the, the landscape can um, really go far um, without much more help. It's already there. Um, so you've, you've made clear why environmentalists and, and uh, farmers and, and lovers of, of parks and gardens uh, would love the Nolan Olmsted approach to city planning and neighborhood design. Um, but why might a, a developer or, or investor or home buyer love it? We saw that in the Marymount example that there was some examination of the dollars and, and cents of 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 Marymount. Um, what what can you speak to Lake Wales and, and and future development in Lake Wales? And is there a connection? Yeah, great there? question. Yeah, I don't remember. I showed that picture of Marymount and myself in Baldwin Park, mm -hmm. right? I'm I moved into Baldwin Park because my premise was I had to buy earlier. I couldn't afford it. Baldwin Park is designed on new urbanist Nolan principles. Its real estate now is more expensive than Winter Park. So the message to the developer is if you build this way, people will come. It's simple supply and demand. Well, I lived in Baldwin Park. I could walk out my door. It's been a rough day at the college. I could go down to my favorite bar, have as many drinks as I want and stumble home, right? But in all seriousness, I also had a 14-year-old who didn't want to speak to me, but she had to eat. We could walk to the grocery store. On the way to the grocery store, we might have conversation, but I let her pick what she wanted to eat. And we'd walk home of our groceries and we'd be talking like we're related, right? <laughs> and so you have that whole experience. And I think that is what Lake Wales developers want to provide. You can come to Lake Wales and have an experience. It's not going to be a subdivision, right? A subdivision of land where you have to get in your car to have that type of experience, right? But actually a neighborhood that's connected to other neighborhoods that have those experiences. Right. So one conversation um, that, you know, any community community can relate to and, and um, is often a topic of, of conversation um, is traffic. Um, and um, so what would what would Nolan say about the concept of of widening roads to to deal with with mounting traffic versus solving traffic problems with the design of the neighborhood itself uh, or of the the town itself? Well, you have to remember John Nolan did not have a car till he was fifty years old. And his office was in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and he would walk home for um, lunch and a light nap and come walk back to his office. So in his mindset, you have to remember, you know, 100 years ago, the great thing was this point where one of every three trips was by foot, one of every three trips was by mass transit, and one of every three trips was by car. I mean, ideally, that's what we want. So you know, to drop that mindset in, well, I have to have a car. I guess I, I, you know, FDOT, like, they have a mindset of moving traffic. Um, we want to have a mindset of creating communities. And I think, you know, it's this, it's this special, um, it's a balance. We've lost the balance that we had during Nolan's time. And I think, the key is if you're going to have uh, neighborhoods, they have to be walkable and they have to be on the scale of Winter uh, Baldwin Park. I mean, I have everybody go look at Baldwin Park where it's got this radical thing called sidewalks and street trees on either <laughs> side, right? And you can see where you're going. So when you go out walking, you know, it's a, a wonderful experience. And the, the thing it's, the, you know, Orlando – having neighborhoods and walkable places is so rare that on um, Halloween, like every parent in Orlando drops her kid off in Baldwin park, right. And the population quadruples. Right. Um, that's what, that's the message you need, right? Mm -hmm. so how can we have places where our kids could go trick or treating is that as important as moving traffic at 32.3 miles per hour at 4 30 PM. Right. So, yeah, I, 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 
to me, it's a certain amount of common sense. And there was just an article in the New York Times, I think we all probably read it, uh, about how we have 7 billion parking spots in the United States. And they're, you know, not even filled, what, two, three hours of the day. How do those parking lots become places for people to live? So there's a message out there, right? Mm -hmm. And I think what Lake Wales is important because they're realizing the future is at hand. We can only expand so much. And if Lake Wales 10, 25, 50 years from now is going to be uh, competitive and it's going to have a valuable community, you want to have those values over that time period. And I guess my best example would be when Olmsted designed Central Park, he designed it for a 50 year time frame. They would take 50 years for the trees to grow in. And sure. you want to start setting this 50 year vision, but you you can't operate like we're it's 1985. And the last thing I'll say uh, on this is, you know, you look at the amenities in 1985, the number one amenity was a golf course for people. You look at younger people, number one amenity today is a bike trail. So you begin to think that concept. Right. Uh, we have two follow-up questions, um, and and then I think that would be it for the question and answer um, section. Um, so you, you spoke recently about how you visited downtown Lake Wales and, and found a, a comeback underway. Um, and, and you were shocked to discover live music, food, and, and new entrepreneurs. Uh, can you talk about why that was surprising to see? And, you know, what what, what do you think will come next? What what do you feel is like is, is happening in, in Lake Wales right now? Well, so actually, I'd been on a hike because that's my favorite place to go. And we were dying to get a good meal. And we came to downtown Lake Wales. I hadn't been in four or five years. We saw Park Avenue. Oh, just like Winter Park. And we saw people park and people standing outside. It's like, oh, let's go there. And before we got there, we could hear music. And we go, man, that doesn't that's really good piped in music. And then <laughs> we walked in and it was like John Coltrane was playing the saxophone on stage. And it was instantly, you know, folks in the Harlem Renaissance is literally great. We found a place and just the atmosphere in that um, whale, Lake Wales point, the atmosphere in there was foreign. We don't get that in park Avenue in winter park. Right. It, mm -hmm. you know, that type of, uh what's the right word um spontaneity doesn't exist but i i found that there was this art and culture and people maybe taking a risk stepping outside the bounds to offer something new and different and that in of alone was exciting enough for me to want to continue to come back yeah so um why did rollins college decide to to pitch in as a, a co-sponsor and, and, and partner for Lake Wales Envisioned? Well, I need to be upfront. It's basically me. <laughs> <laughs> well, and what I do and my teacher at Rollins, we have what's called um, community engagement where mm -hmm. students get a special CE credit and we partner with a community to do good work. Uh, such as I showed you the Genius Preserve, that's one of them. So I saw... Uh, you know, Victor, I saw his presentation, A Thousand Friends of Florida, and this opportunity for my students to participate and see the evolution of a planning practice based on an Olmstead plan mm -hmm. was amazing. And I should mention when I teach the senior level environmental planning course, the first document the students analyze is Portland's Park Plan. Uh, and when I went to Portland for the first time in 1990, I went met with the parks director as kind of a copy of your park plan and that's what they handed me wow. and i was thinking wouldn't it be cool if anybody asks what's the vision of lake wales give them the olmstead plan right <laughs> and then the next one is you know what you guys are working on so that i think is this wonderful opportunity to see the past and the future melding but it's what we also do in our other classes right well great thank you so much bruce for your time and we'll be sharing this video with um, with all interested, and it'll be on our website at lakewellsenvision.com. Thank you, everybody.